Welcome everyone. I'm really stoked that you're here. We got a big, big size group. There's people still coming in. I can see on my little control thing here to my left. And if you notice me looking to my left, that is because that is where all my notes are and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the subject for today is how to use Orpub's cubing theory spreadsheet. Okay. Now, before we actually get into the spreadsheet, I'm gonna we're gonna have to talk about you know cubing theory for a little bit. But I'm gonna try and make it as straightforward as I can. Um, because once we kind of know just some just some core basics of cubing theory, the spreadsheet kind of it kind of becomes alive, so you can actually use it. Okay? And so I want to make sure that you're comfortable with it. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of numbers, and it can be extremely confusing. All right. All right. Hey. So I'm getting an error on the side. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You cannot download the typing log yet because it has not been created. Okay, that is, so this does not exist yet. It will though, um, a couple hours after uh, the webinar today. Okay, so that's gonna be our typing log. In fact, I'm gonna put that right here. On my desktop, here we go. Okay, all right. Hey, where's everybody from? Let, let's do that. That's kind of really fun to do. I can, there's still people coming in right now because it's beeping like crazy in my ear. So where's everybody from? Type, type like your city country in. All right, Ragu, you're in India. Let's see, we got the Netherlands. Oh, fantastic. Virginia, I mean, Wisconsin. Uh, let's see, James. Yeah, oh, and when you do the chat, chat publicly so everybody can see too. Wow, we got people all over. Okay, we, we got, uh, oh, I gotta go back now. I missed some, I was, I was yakking. We got Ghana, uh, awesome. Toronto, Canada, Germany. Another um, Ontario, let's see, Indianapolis, California. Oh, welcome, Uday. It's good to have you on here, man. All right, Manford from Vienna. Ooh, hope you guys are having a good summer there. Let's see, Buenos Aires, fantastic. Argentina, all right. That's fantastic. And we even have Kentucky, all right. And Kansas, India, Sao Paulo, Ooh, awesome. So we do have a South America contingent, which is awesome. And we have Barry from New Jersey. All right, that's good. We got, uh, we don't have, yeah, the timing is really wrong for Australia. It's, that's always the problem, isn't it? So all of you that are watching the recording from Australia, New Zealand, that part of the world, my apologies for the timing on this thing. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Let's get into it. We're going to talk about how to use uh, my cubing theory spreadsheet. And this thing has been around for years and years before I even, um, before I left Oracle, uh, my, the team that I work with, we had a cubing theory spreadsheet, you know, just basically exactly like this. And so when I left, um, when I left Oracle, um, I actually took the, the core cubing theory functions, the actual math, and then I created and I embedded those into a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. And I added a bunch of stuff over the years, which is pretty nice. And I'll just talk about a couple of those today. All right. So quick announcement. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but one of my LVCs, it's for, I call it the fast path. It's for people that are like brand new to Oracle and are just like, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on, basically. <laughs> okay. This, this LVC is for you guys. I, we, we priced it. We priced it super low. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's just yeah, um, but but I want I, I want everybody, I want every Orpub member to be able to take this thing because LVCs are not included in Orpub memberships. So every Orpub member, if they want to take this class, they get a fifty percent discount. Okay, which brings it down to like even the most expensive it could be. Um, I think is like ninety nine dollars or something like that. Okay, so um, if you're Orpub member and you want to do this, take this take this uh, email Katrina at Orpub dot com and she will give you the discount code. Okay, and I just checked today on the event calendar and it starts July thirty first. I think there's four sessions. The way I do LVCs are they're two hours and then we usually have at least a one day break and then we have the other session. You know, and then there's usually a break. You know, and then another session. So usually it's like a Tuesday, Thursday kind of a thing. And that spreads it out and it, you have homework to do. So it's a really good classroom environment. And it's very unique how I do these things. So that's the discount for Orpub members. I don't want to forget to mention that because that's an unusual thing. 
So those of you that are brand new Aura Pub members, or if you've never gone to this onboarding webinar, because this is actually brand new, this will be the first one. Um, it's gonna be July 18th. Okay, so this is just for members. And the content, like what I'm gonna talk about is on the event calendar. Okay, so you go to the event calendar right here, um, and it's really easy to get to that. You just go to training, and then you go down to event calendar. Okay, that's the easiest way to actually get, I think that's the only way to get to it. Okay, registration is required. Okay, and that's, uh, there's reasons for that, which I'm not gonna talk about right now, um, but the registration is required. Okay, so that is, uh, no, this will not be uploaded on, uh, on YouTube, the recording. However, all my webinars, public and members only, you can watch on my website. So if you just go to, heck, let me make this bigger. There we go. That's really big. Let's try this. There we go. So you go to orapub.com and you go to training. You see the webinar link right there. Okay. By the way, the event calendar is below that right there. So there's the webinar link. And you go there and uh, all the webinars that I've done, I and mean, we have like over 60 of these now. It's getting pretty crazy. Um, you'll always have at the top now the live onboarding webinar because I'm going to do these once a month. And then, of course, then you have all this crazy stuff. So you will see, um, this is taking up all my bandwidth here. Um, you will see, in fact, if you just search for free or public, you can list, you will find all the, all the free public webinars. Okay. So those, I, I don't put those on YouTube. I could, I guess, but. That's just something else to do. Okay, so let's get going. Good question. And if you guys have any questions or comments, go ahead and just type those in. Okay, everybody sees those. Then this is all being recorded. Okay, um, and um, I can kind of see when the questions come in, um, and I will answer them right away, or I will just wait till the end. And by the way, when we're officially done, I will stay online as long as people have questions. Okay, and usually that's the most interesting time of the webinar is at the very end. So. Uh, let's see, ramp, oh, oh um, if I upload, it, anything that I have on YouTube is public, okay? Um, I would never put private stuff on YouTube because it's too easy for people to basically steal the content, so I don't do that. Okay, so here's the situation and the plan for today, okay? Believe it or not, queuing theory helps us to understand why, and this is key, why our tuning solutions make sense or why they don't make sense also, okay? And it's also really good for helping understand why performance problems are occurring. And it really forms the basis for much of performance engineering, which is like forecasting, capacity planning, you know, planning, that kind of stuff, okay? And I mean, this is, of course, this is what I believe, right? This is my stance on this, is that queuing theory is indeed useful. I use it like all the time, not the numbers, but the concepts, I like every day of my work, I believe it's useful and gives us insights. I mean, really deep insights that just over time just are just reinforced and reinforced. And I'd say 90% of the DBAs know nothing about this. <laughs> I'm serious, man. It drives me crazy, <laughs> you know, because it's, you, you, you get such deep insights by just understanding some of this basic stuff. So in this webinar, I'm going to make sure that you know how to use the queuing theory spreadsheet. Okay. And I'm also going to teach some queuing theory essentials, kind of the core basics. And then I actually have like three questions I want to, I want to answer using the spreadsheet. Okay. And so we'll actually, you actually get to see me use it as well. Okay. Oh yeah. And this webinar too, I said is being recorded. It will also be on the tools on my, on, on the actual spreadsheet page. In fact, let's just do that. How do you get the tool? Okay. You go to resources, then you go to tools. You click on that, and then you scroll down because it's not the most popular tool, right? I mean, surprise, 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 queuing theory. Uh, let's see. Right there it is. It's called the QMMM. We're not going to talk about MMM stuff today. That's We don't need to know that. But here's the spreadsheet right here. You just click on this. You can tell I've up had an update this thing in a long time. Yeah, this thing's been used forever. Um, down below it. Oh yeah, this is a great, you guys gotta watch. This is one of my video seminars. Um, but anyways, I will actually put a link for this recording, this webinar on this page right here. 
Okay, because I if I have a webinar about how to use a tool, I always try and put that on the on the actual page. Okay, so that's kind of the situation um, in terms of oh my LVCs. Where does this fit in the most? Clearly, the performance in engineering is really uh, you know the, the core of this. I will get into it slightly when I um, in the AWR LVC, um, but um, clearly the performance engineering this is a big deal. Okay. Now, some of you, especially if you're members and you watch most of my videos, you've heard this before, but this, believe it or not, this little example of candy in a jar right here, a glass today, is, is filled with insights about cubing theory. I'm not, it's believe it or not. So forget what's on the screen. Let's talk about just the candy here. In this cup right here, in this glass, okay, I have five pieces of candy. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and I feel like I'm doing a magic trick. So we got five pieces of candy, okay? That's key, five pieces. Now, if it takes me one minute, um, or I should say one second to eat each one of these, which I, I will not be doing in case you're wondering, but if it takes me one second to get each piece of candy out and shove it in my mouth, the question then is, well, how long is it gonna take for me to empty out the candy jar? Okay, five pieces of candy, one second for each piece of candy to get it out and to eat it. So how long does it take to empty this thing? Five seconds, right? There's no, there's no rocket science. There's really, the, there's, it, it's super, super simple, okay? And so now this is, if you think about it, and I'm not gonna get into this super deep, but there's really, there's two things going on here, kind of three. First of all, um, there's no parallelization. It's only me, there's only one hand. Okay, so this is a serial kind of thing. Nobody else gets in my candy jar. It's just me. The second thing is, how many pieces of candy are there? There's five. And then how long does it take to eat each piece of candy? One second, which means it's going to take five seconds to empty out this whole thing and for me to get like a big old sugar buzz. All right. So how does this relate to Oracle and cubing theory? It's huge. First of all, let's relate this to what's called elapsed time in Oracle. Okay, which is the CPU and the wait time. Okay, so let's say I had a query, all right, and this query's got to access 100,000 logical IOs. That's like 100,000 pieces of candy. Okay, and each of these logical IOs takes 0 0.02 milliseconds. Okay, so how long is it going to take to eat like 100,000 pieces of candy, right? Or how long is it going to take for Oracle to process 100,000 logical IOs? Well, you simply multiply the 100,000 by the point uh, by the point 02 milliseconds, just like the five multiplied by the one second for each piece of candy. And therefore, the elapsed time is going to be uh, 2,000 milliseconds or two seconds. Okay. Now that's just like, well, yeah, of, of course it makes sense, right? Okay. But this is where it gets a little weird because what I've done, and I just mentioned this before, there's really two things. Well, there's three: the parallelism, but we're not going to talk about parallelism. This is all serial. There's really two kind of knobs here that we can turn to mess with this. One is how many pieces of work. In this case, each, each little piece of work is a logical IO, okay? And so there's 100,000 of these. And then, so how long does it take to like process each piece of work? Well, it's gonna take 0 0.02 milliseconds to process each piece of candy or to process each logical IO, okay? This is super important. Now, how does this relate to queuing theory? It's because this 0 0.02, this time to process a piece of work, the time to process one piece of work, that is what's called the response time. And response time is super key to understanding queuing theory and the components of response time. Okay, so if I wanna speed up this query, Hey, can you guys see me? Jeff uh, is unable to see me. Yes, you can see me, Jeff. I'm hoping you can see me now. Okay, good, good, good. All right. So this time to process, sorry, Jeff. Um, this time to process this one piece of work, that's called the response time. Okay. And the reason that that's so important is because there are ways to change and ways to alter the response time. Some of those are related to, to what we can do as performance people. Some of those are related to what the operations guys can do with workloads. 
some of that's related to the kind of hardware that we have and the power of the hardware and the speed and all this kind of stuff. But if we can alter the response time, if we can alter how long it takes me to eat a piece of candy, like if I can figure out a way to eat it faster, we can alter the response time and that will then spill over in altering the elapsed time, which will improve the user experience. Okay. Of course, the other way to make this thing finish is if we like tune the SQL, then maybe we don't have to process all five pieces of work. Maybe we only have to process two pieces of work. If, we, if I only have to process two pieces of work and I don't change the response time, it's going to take, you know, two. So well, I got two left here. It's going to take two times the one second. It's going to take two seconds, of course. All right. So believe it or not, that actually ties into a response time or cubing theory quite a bit. The really bizarre uh, part about this is like, where do you, can I get this from, from an AWR report? You actually can get this. Okay. So here's an example of SQL ordered by gets right here. Okay. So we want to know, well, what's the average elapsed time? Not the total, but the average. Well, it's, there's no, no surprise here, right? You get the total elapsed time and you divide by the number of executions. Okay. So the total elapsed time is right over here. If you can see this, right? The 27016. That's the total elapsed time. So I put that there and I divide that by the total executions, which is of course right here. So each completed execution, um, you know, shows up here. Okay. And so then the average elapsed time, okay is this 2,700 seconds right there, okay? So that's that's the most obvious way to get this, okay? So, but let's look at it from kind of how we looked at it before. This is more of a queuing theory way of looking at it and really highlights the ways that we can alter the knobs that we have to mess with the elapsed time. Same kind of thing here. I think is the other one by gets to, yeah, same screen right here, same a part of the AWR report but I'm putting it into this format right here, okay? So what's how many units of work, like how many logical IOs per execution? That's the gets per execution right here, 29,000. So you just type that in, okay? Um, how long does it take to process one piece of work? Well, let's take this total elapsed time, right? That's the 27,116 and divide that by all the pieces of work which is the total buffer gets right here. So if I divide all the time by all the work, I'm gonna get the time per piece of work. The time to process one piece of work, that's the response time, okay? And so if you actually do the math and carry this out, we end up with 2,701 seconds, which is exactly what we came up with on the previous screen, 2,001 by just taking the total elapsed time divided by the total execution. It's just a different way of looking at the math, but it still equates out to the same thing. Okay, now, by understanding this and understanding the knobs that we have here to reduce the elapsed time, for example, we can reduce the number of pieces of work. We can reduce the time it takes to process a piece of work. Okay, so you can answer questions like that. And we're not, we're not gonna go through this because we don't have time. Uh, but you, we can answer questions like if we tune the SQL resulting in a 50% reduction in buffer gets, what's the anticipated elapsed time? That's like saying, uh, you know, I'm not going to process five pieces of work. I'm going to process two and a half or eat two and a half pieces of candy, something like that. Okay. And here's another one right here. This is a really cool one. I like this. The SLA dictates the SQL must complete within 1,000 seconds. So that's the elapsed time. That's our SLA. Okay, um, what is the maximum number of logical IOs the statement can actually process? Well, if we know what this elapsed time has to be 1,000, okay, and I know the response time, I know the time it takes to process this piece of work, you can figure this out, then you just kind of do a little algebra and you can figure out, man, we, how many units of work, that the maximum units of work that we can process and still meet that 1,000 second elapsed time. You can actually do some really cool stuff like that, okay? And then, then there's, of course, there's another question here. So anyway, all right. So let's, how, how is this relate? Okay, this is really key for understanding today. A lot of you guys have probably seen this before. This is called the response time curve or chart right here, okay? The key to understanding cubing theory, okay? Okay, there's is these axes right here. 
All right, let's make sure this is nice and big right here. Okay, so queuing theory relates workload with time. In fact, let me just simplify it, relates work with time. Okay, so because there is a relationship. Now we all know this as, as DBAs. We know that, hey, if I increase the workload intensity, um, things can get bad, right? We just know that, oh, we have a lot of users, the system's slowing down. So we inherently know there's the relationship between work and time. Well, queuing theory, these really smart guys, right? Once when telephones were being invented and all that, they needed to, to figure out like, you know, like how many wires that they needed and, and stuff like that, or how long is it going to take for the voice to get from one place to another? Or I don't know, stuff like that. They need to figure out this kind of stuff. And so they figured out the math that relates the workload intensity. We call this the arrival rate. They relay, figured out the math to relate the workload with response time. And response time, remember, is how long it takes to process one little piece of work. So if I know my arrival rate and I know, understand the relationship between work and time, I can then forecast, I can predict the response time, the time it takes to process a piece of work. And if I can forecast the response time, I can now say, you know what? I know how long it's going to take to empty out the entire jar. I know how long it's going to take to run that, 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 that SQL statement. And I can also tell you if you increase the workload or if you decrease the workload, how's that going to affect how long? Well, it, it, let me just back up. If, if, if um, I can do predictions, like if I decrease the workload or increase the workload, okay, that will result in a different response time potentially. And if the response time changes, since the response time is related to each little piece of work, I know how long it's going to take to empty out the entire glass under different workload scenarios. Powerful stuff. But this is, this is the missing link that people don't get. When they look at this kind of chart and they say, okay, response time, so what? What's that? That's some ethereal kind of made up thing. Well, it can be some made up thing, but if you relate it to something like a logical IO or to a physical IO, or to a transaction, something meaningful that you can equate to like one little piece of work and how many pieces of work it takes to actually process a SQL statement. If you can do that, then this becomes extremely powerful because this crazy queuing theory stuff now relates to how long it takes to run a SQL statement. And that is when it, boom, when it really gets very cool. Okay, so that's that's what this chart is about. It, it shows us the relationship between the workload intensity and also the response time. Okay, and this 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 line right here that is the result of math. That is math, not like reality. Okay, but and but I'm not going to get into does it really work? Yeah, it really works, but it's it's not always that simple, of course. Okay, all right. So I think. Those are some of the key things. All right, so we talked about response time. Okay, time to process. This is, okay, what's the key word here? How many pieces of work? Response time is related to how many pieces of work? Derek says one. Anybody else, what do you think? Yeah, it's one. One, 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 one piece of work, okay? It's the elapsed time time to process all the work. Like, you know, with say, for example, within a SQL statement, okay? Something like that. That's how they're related right there, okay? And so you say, well, what's the math? Well, the elapsed time is okay uh, the work times the time to process one piece of work and that's just what we talked about before if you remember the candy jar okay remember 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 the can i say the candy jar or whatever if you re it, it, if you if you get this you get it all right i know it sounds silly but it's really true okay so we know, okay, now we need to dig into, oh, by the way, <clears throat> let me show you a little bit. Here's the math <clears throat> right here, okay? But before we get into that math, what these things mean, we got to talk a little bit deeper, okay? And I think there's one word. We talked about pieces of work, 
a piece of work. I'll say unit of work, like a piece of work. For example, you know, a logical I.O., physical I.O. It could be, you know, anything, trans whatever you define a transaction to be. Okay, boom. Okay. All right. Okay, now, <clears throat> there's t this response time right here on this vertical axis, all right, um, is really made up of two, two kind of pieces, two components of time. Okay, I'm going to put the uh, response time is going to be RT for right now, okay? Okay, so the response time is two pieces of time. Uh, if you actually break it down, a really good way to think about this is when you go to a restaurant, Okay, you walk into a restaurant, you're greeted by like a host or hostess, and you you have arrived at the restaurant, and people are arriving at the restaurant at a certain rate. That's the a workload. That's the arrival rate. How many people arrive per second, per minute, that kind of thing. And so you've arrived, okay, and you're talking to the hostess. Well, at that time, you're not actually being served, right? You don't. You're not at a table yet, so you are waiting for that table, you are queuing at that point, okay? Once you're sitting down and you're being served, then there's the other component of time is the service time. And so you're being, so we have the queuing and we have the service, servicing, that's kind of servicing kind of thing, right? And so that's where you get this queue time plus the service time, and that equals the response time. So built within this response time, there's two components. There's there's always some service time because, you know, like I could just walk right into the restaurant and go to my table. So there's no queue time. Right. There's just being serviced. But as the restaurant gets busier, there's more there's a higher probability that I will have to queue right before I get my table. So as the workload increases, as more people start arriving, the, the intensity of people arriving in the restaurant increases. Right. I, I not only have the, the time I'm being served, that's that's going to be fixed. OK, but what can change based on this workload is the queue time. And that's what gives us that bend, that elbow and the curve. That is when all this the difference between how long it takes to be serviced compared to the response time, that difference, that gap, which keeps increasing. That's this queue time right here. Okay, and queuing theory allows us to actually figure these out. Not only the response time, but the components of the response time as well. Okay, all right, so that's, that's important. Now, everybody good so far? We're almost ready to get to the, to the spreadsheet. Okay, in fact, let me just bring up the spreadsheet here for you. Two days good. All right, this is what it looks like, but I'm gonna restart it though. So, you know, you download this thing, and you double click on it, all right? It's an old Excel spreadsheet. It's gonna say, hey, there's macros in this thing, which can be dangerous, right? So you, you have to decide whether or not this is a safe thing. It's on you. But you know, I, I, to my knowledge, nobody's hacked this or doing nefarious activities. So you click enable macros. In order to use this, you have to enable the macros because the queuing theory math is built within Visual Basic um, functions, which are like embedded within Excel macros. Uh, that's just the way it is, right? Uh, that's because I'm using like serious cubing theory math and not just real simple equations. Okay. There you go. Okay. So you got it. That's going to look something like this and I'll make this a little bigger so we can all see this. There we go. Now there's multiple tabs on the spreadsheet right here. Multiple tabs. All right. So the first thing you're going to say, okay, first of all, how is this put together? There, you, can, you can do two cases if you want to. Like there's case one and case two, right? So you can get all the numbers, all the math, but you can get a graph for each of the cases, and then we can compare the two cases together. In this, in this case, the cases are the same, okay? So let's just, I'm going to get this even bigger here. Yeah, here we go. And then all the underlying math that is based, that the graphs are based upon, and some other math, that's all there for you. Okay, so these are all the different tabs. Okay, so the main one, let's focus on this. 
the first thing you got to answer, and this is uh, this is the usually the stumbling block for people when they see this is the first thing you got to enter in is it's called the description is queues in the system, and the other one here is servers per queue. You're like, what the heck is that, man? <laughs> okay. That's what I'm going to talk about. What's a queue in the system and how many queues are in the system and how many servers are there per each queue? Okay, so that's what we're going to figure out right here. By the way, um, one of the first things you do with this spreadsheet is you actually type in the unit of work. In this case, it was people. And the unit of time, in this case, it was minutes. It might be logical IOs per millisecond, something like that. But that's important because you can get really messed up by you know what's in the numerator, what's the denominator. If you set the unit of work and the unit of time, then throughout the entire spreadsheet, the entire workbook here, you will see like, for example, um, if you notice this, but it says like minutes per people, that's all based upon that what you put in here. Okay, and that makes it, the chances of you putting in the numbers like the reciprocal, is just pretty much eliminated if you do this, okay? These variables right here, these are the actual queuing theory variables that you will find in books and the underlining math, the visual basic macros, which you can actually see, they're not, they're not protected or hidden. Um, this is the math, the formulas that are actually used, okay? So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk about some of these numbers a little bit later, only when it becomes more useful to us. But we need to understand What's this queues in the system and the servers per queue? All right, so that's what we're going to talk about right now. Okay. All right. You guys still with me? Everybody good? I got to take a quick little break right here. All right. Sounded like Siri just went off or something. Oh my gosh. Siri was like, recording i must have said something that siri liked anyways that's weird it's almost like alexa recording everything i say but that's a whole nother discussion all right queues and servers uh, there are many ways to diagram this but this is how i typically do it so the blue circles and usually when you draw what's called a server that is going to be like a circle right here okay now what is a server okay a server A server, this, I know it's going to sound really strange, a server serves transactions, serves transactions, or like serves work, or a piece of work, a piece of, or actually just serves work, but it's one piece at a time though, okay, but it serves, it serves work. That's what it does. That's why when you walk into a restaurant, right, and you're talking to like the hostess or the person serving you, okay, um, that would be like the server. Okay, you know, you could just combine those together. Um, something else like could be a CPU core, could be a server. Okay, and that could be a like a person in a restaurant. I know I spelled that wrong. Um, a CPU core, an IO device. It could be a lane on a road, something like that. Okay, if you think about it. Okay. Um, it could be as you, if you watch the intro to that, that video seminar I have, it could be, um, it could also be like a stove in a kitchen. Okay, I'm talking like one part of the stove where you can actually cook a burger on or something like that. Okay, something like that. Okay, it serves. And so in this case right here, I'm asking how many servers are in this configuration right here? And there's no trick questions right here. No tr How many servers do I have diagrammed here? Four, exactly. Oh, Ram, you asked what are the details we need to fill in. I'm going to go. Th I'm going to go through three examples today on that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to leave you. You know, like great. Thanks, Craig, for the spreadsheet, but I still don't know how to use it. No problem. Yeah, there's four servers right here. Okay, so that's the first thing. And how many servers are over here? Four. But you notice there's something very different about these, but they both have four 
servers. And these could represent a CPU core. They could be an IO device. They could be you know, a person at the restaurant. They could be like, we could have a four lane highway right here. Think of it like that. Okay. All right. But there's obviously a big difference here. Okay. And these little rectangular line things here. Uh, yeah. Uh, rectangles. Wow. Those are those represent a queue, and you know those of you, those of us that are like born and raised in the U.S., queues are not something that you normally talk about, right? To us, we call them a line. Right? Let's get in the line. Well, the rest of the world says, "Hey, we need to get in the queue. We need to queue up." So the whole thing of queuing theory is much more kind of it's actually easier for non-U.S. kind of born and raised people to understand because we don't use we don't we're not brought up with using the word queue and what it what it actually means in real life to us. But a queue is simply what you have to get into, right? You have to enter the queue. You must in queue before you can be serviced by one of the available servers. Okay. By the way, a server in this case is typically not a like database server. It's not a physical box. Okay. You could represent, you could abstract it like that. But don't don't think that's that is what I'm talking about. Yeah, I should have said that right away. I've had people come up to me at seminars during the break and say, "Craig, you're talking about like like 150 servers, database servers." I'm like, "Oh no 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 no, cores. You know, there's a difference there." Okay, so this is the queue right here. So in order to be serviced by any one of these core, uh, servers, we have to enter this queue. So in this case, there's one queue. Okay. In this situation, there is four queues. In fact, we have one queue for each one of the servers right here. Okay. Now, this is your extra credit question here, is one of these um, is more like a CPU subsystem, and one of these is more like uh, an I.O. subsystem. Yeah, I just noticed we're, we're, we filled up the – oh, no, they – we filled up the room, but somehow we got an extension so more people can join the webinar. Hmm. All right. Anyways, so one of these is more like a CPU subsystem, and one of these is more like, let's say, an I/O subsystem. And I'm just, so anybody have a guess on that? And we don't spend a lot of time. Okay. And and the way that we speak about queuing, even in IT, naturally leads us to to one of these for more of a CPU centric architecture and the other one's more of like an IO architecture. So which one's the CPU, the one on the left or the one on the right? What do you think? We got, oh, we got it. All right. All right. So let me think about this. Have you ever heard somebody say, hey, we got to check the CPU run queues. Something's not right with the CPU run queues. Now, Usually we don't we don't we don't talk like that. We say, "Hey, what's the CPU run queue?" Okay. Um, how about talking about an I/O subsystem? Um, when, when we talk when we when we look at an I/O subsystem, we look at each device, each server, and we check out what's the average queue length of all the servers, or or like what's the queue length of a particular I/O device. When it gets really hot, the queue gets really long on that I/O device. So if you think about even the way we speak, the one on the left is more like a CPU subsystem. Okay, when you get down to the lower level architecture, clearly there's going to be a little queue probably somehow on each one of these. But from a conceptual standpoint, and, and really how we should think about this, there's one CPU run queue. In order to be serviced by any of these CPU cores, let's say you've got to get in this one. You got to be in the queue. There's definite advantages to this kind of situation. And this is more like an I.O. subsystem. That's why you can have a super hot devices and the other devices can be idle unless you have some kind of software that is able to balance this out. And that took a lot of years for vendors to figure that kind of thing out. OK, so we don't want to get too much into that, but you need to understand this is the number of servers and this is the number of queues, ASM. Yeah, for Veritas and there are a number of, you know, uh, folks that did that. Now it's in this. There's a lot of there's. It's super tricky to, to balance that out. But anyways, okay. So <clears throat> here's the key question on the left: How many queues are in the system? 
And this is like the system right here. How many queues? There's one. Okay. How many servers are there <clears throat> per queue? <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, um, there are four servers per queue, okay? Because we have one queue, these are the servers per queue, because there's only one queue, right? All right, in this case, how many servers are there? How many servers? No rocket science, no tricks. There's four, right? Exactly, you count one, two, three, four. How many servers are there for each one of these queues right here? How many, you guys knew I was gonna ask, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, there is one server per queue right here. Say one server per queue. I, I pointed wrong or backwards that way. There's one server for each one of these queues. And here, there's four servers for, per queue. There only happens to be one queue. Okay, all right, that's important. You say, well, what's the big deal? Because the queuing theory math needs to know that. Because by just changing those couple of those numbers, we can define all sorts of different types of queuing systems. And that's why we do that. So queues in the system, and this to, to kind of model what we have in our picture right here on the left, that would be one queue in the system, and there's four servers per queue. On the one on the left, there's four queues in the system, and we have one queue or one server for each queue. That's how you would actually do that one. Okay, so this is the one on the left. This is more like a CPU subsystem. This is more like an IO subsystem. So when we talk about CPU subsystems, which is when I typically would use queuing theory now, because IO subsystems are, there's so much software and they got their own operating system and there's, it gets so complicated. I, I don't even use queuing theory for IO subsystems anymore. For CPU subsystems, they can. It work. It tracks really good. So whenever we do it, uh, whenever we model a CPU subsystem, we're going to be looking at the queues in the system. Okay, that's always going to be one. And then this would be the number of cores is what I would actually use. I don't use threads. I don't use sockets. I don't use uh, whatever. I it's the it, it, I use cores. Okay, um, and that's another discussion that we don't really want to get into today. Okay, so I think we are ready to actually. Um, do some of this. Okay, so let's say that I felt or I, I verified that there's a really strong correlation between user calls, that's the Oracle statistic, user calls, with, um, with, uh, with, uh, with the CPU utilization, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and relate the workload of user calls to the CPU utilization, all right? So how would I do this? Okay, so, First of all, I'm going to say my unit of work, this is the first thing you want to fill out in the spreadsheet. We're going to put user call. Whoops, not user call. I, can't, I could do cars, but that's really not what we're going to do today. User call. And for, for my unit of time, we're going to use milliseconds. Usually when we do Oracle work, it, the unit of time is usually milliseconds. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so, and you'll notice everything changed here from milliseconds to user call. And sometimes, you know, you can just abbreviate and put UC for user call. Okay, and in fact, let me just keep it like that. Okay, it makes it a little, a little cleaner. Um, but but you got to realize that a user, you know what, I'm going to put user call back in there. Okay, I don't want you to have to make multiple jumps of understanding what I'm talking about. Okay, in fact, what if I, I'm going to put, I'm going to put an underscore right here. Here we go. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so let's see. How, we're going to model a CPU subsystem, so there's one queue in the system. Okay, and I'm going to start with, let's say I have 12 cores. Okay, now this is something you probably know, right? Let's just let's talk about real life. Okay, so I have 12 CPU cores. Okay, you probably know, you probably, I'll say you probably do not know the service time. That's how long that's how much CPU time it takes. Actual CPU consumption cycle time to process one user call. That is not the response time, right? That is that is just the service time. When it means service right here, that's what we're talking about. Okay, you you're not going to know that. 
Okay, so that's a mystery right now. Okay, but so we're going to actually derive that. Right? The arrival rate. You can figure out the user calls per millisecond. Right. Look at your AWR report or extract the data yourself. How many? Like, let's say over that one hour AWR report, there were like a gazillion user calls. That's your numerator. Your denominator is going to be, well, how many milliseconds are in that snapshot interval, that one hour? So if you take the total number of user calls, okay, divided by the, the amount of time, in fact, let me just say this, okay, your, your average arrival rate, an example of this could be you take the total user calls divided by the snapshot interval, okay? And you got to make sure you convert to the, to the correct unit of time when you put stuff in here. Usually when I do this like for real, I actually would type in something, I put equal and I'd say, well, we had, you know, 500, I'll say, you know, 500,000 user calls over 60 minutes. And then you got to convert that to milliseconds. So I actually put the math right in the spreadsheet. That way, I, when I go back later and say, how did I come up with this weird number? I say, oh yeah, that's that big number. That must be the user calls. And I can see I converted, you know, the snapshot interval to milliseconds. And so let's say in this example that it comes out to 11.320, okay, per millisecond, which is actually a lot, okay, actually a lot. Okay, now I, don't worry about all these negative numbers yet. Okay, now let's say, uh, oh, this response time tolerance, there's no math related. This is like the SLA. This is like the acceptable response time. Okay, so I'm going to put that at zero right now. That's just used visually to see how close we are to the elbow and or, or to the yeah to the elbow and the curve. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, how do I check these cues are cores? Um, you decide, and you're going to know if it doesn't work because if you actually do this for real, the numbers you're going to get aren't going to reflect reality. Okay, remember you got we're just looking at one data point too, so this is you're not going to use this for like a, a legitimate forecast that you are responsible for. You're gonna use this to think, man, is what somebody's telling me even close to being right? This doesn't make sense, queuing theory wise, right? That's one way that you'll actually use this. All right, let's keep going here. Um, the, does I always, uh, yes, you always use one queue for CPU subsystem. Yeah, so just keep it at one. Okay, so, but the other piece that, that I do know is I know the utilization and see it says utilization right here. Okay. I know in my system, I actually observed over this one hour snap, snapshot interval where, where I know the arrival rate and I know the number of cores. I also know the utilization. Okay. And it turned out to be 96.1%. Okay. I, I captured that from the OS. I did the math from the AWR report data, whatever. Okay. What you do not want to do, okay? What you do not want to do is type in 96.1. And you know why? Because this is a formula and you'll completely screw everything up. That's why you always make backups of the spreadsheet, okay? So somehow we've got to change our, our one unknown, which is the service time. And we're gonna alter that until the utilization gets to around 96%. Okay, so let's do that. So let's say, obviously, 490% um, utilization is can't possibly happen. You can't go over 100%. That is why we get negative numbers and all that. You'll see once we drop below 100%, we get like positive numbers, okay? All right, so we're going to alter the service time. Let's do one. We're at 94%. Wow, that was like shockingly close. Okay, I didn't want it to be that, that straightforward. Okay. How about 1.5? Nope, 141. 1.2? Nope, 1.1? Nope. Notice what I'm focusing on is this right here. We got to get this 103 number down to 96.1 by altering the service time. 1.001. Ah, closer. 1.01. Ooh, close. Okay. 1.02. That's pretty darn close. Okay, so now what I what I visually see here in terms of servers per queue, service time, arrival rate, and the utilization, it like my, it's like I I locked in and matched my system at least on average over like a one hour period of time. Okay, 
All right. Now, once I have this, now I can look at a little bit of the math and then we can do some what if. OK, so let's um, what this tells me here is that the average queue time. Remember, the service time is when we're actually being serviced by the CPU core. But when the utilization gets high, there's going to be some queue time. Well, what's the average queue time? 1.9195 milliseconds on average. What's the average queue length? Whoa, almost 22 um, uh, user calls are like being queued up to be serviced by the CPU subsystem. That's a long run queue. So what's the expected response time? Now, the expected response time, that is, going back to the PowerPoint here, that is where we cross right here. That's the expected response time right there. That's, that's the axis we're looking at here, okay? All right. All right. Um, and there's some other stuff here. This is a cool one. This is the probability of having to wait or have to queue. 80, there's 85% chance that when a transaction arrives, it's going to have to queue before it gets serviced. So this is a cool little um, way to kind of understand whoops, what's going on here. Okay. All right. So let's actually look at the graph here. Okay. Now, for the graph, I need to know my arrival rates around 11.3. So let's look at this first graph here. Okay. And let's actually zoom in here. Okay. We are right around 11.3. That says 11.4. So if I drew a line up here, that's where I am on the response time curve, okay? So you say, hey, am I in the elbow of the curve? Yes, you are. And the elbow of the curve, right? Elbow of the curve means that a little increase in arrival rate has a big increase in the response time, okay? All right, now, and you can alter the very, you know, the values in here to get a better looking chart. I'm not going to focus on that today. Okay. Um, let's see. A cursor always wants servers per queue. Servers per queue is CPU core on the system, correct? Um, yes, that is correct. Yes. That's why I put 12 there because there's 12 cores in the system. Yeah. Okay. So that's like the chart on the first one. Okay. Let's do Let's let here's our first question here. Okay, so oh by the way, um, yeah, that's there's there's you can we're not going to do this today, but you can use what's called the goal seek. There's in Excel, there's something called goal seek. You can use goal seek to actually quickly figure out this service time instead of having to do, to do trial and error. Okay, but we're not going to use goal seek here today. All right, so um, to get this, I actually used goal seek to get a better number and it was 0189. And now I actually get the 96.1 that I'm looking for right there, okay? So that's our service time. Okay, so first question. Okay. Let's put that in the typing log. Here's our question right here. So that's what we, that's what we figured out, okay, right here to solve for service time. And so you can use these numbers yourself in the spreadsheet. So that's why I have these in the typing log so you can go back and actually see, you know, you can do this yourself. Okay, so if we use 20% faster CPUs, will that get us out of this mess? Okay, and what, what do I mean by mess? The mess means we are operating in the elbow of the curve, which is a place you do not want to be. Uh, not only can the response time, you know, you know, a little bit more workload gets bigger, but typically it fluctuates wildly, okay? And people don't like wildly fluctuating systems. They want consistency. All right, so the question is, what if I have 20% faster CPUs? Now, because we're running out of time here, faster CPU, just like a faster server, will take less time to service a piece of work. So I'm gonna use this case two right here to represent this, okay? I'm gonna set the arrival rates the same, okay? All this same, but we have faster cores. So we are now going to have a faster service time. And it's 20% faster. So I'm going to multiply it by 0.8. So it's going to be a little, notice it's a little fat. It's 20% faster. And so with that 20% faster CPU core, with everything else remaining the same, my utilization drops from 96% to about 77%. 
And look at the Q time. It drops from almost two milliseconds to like under one millisecond. And the average Q length goes from 21 to around one. Much, much better situation. In fact, the probability of waiting, it was 85% of the time. Now it's only 30% of the time. So let's actually compare these charts right now, okay? Here we go. Now, I could make this look better, but we're right around 11, what's 11 point something? 11.3. So we're like right around here somewhere is where we're at, okay? So you can see that we are now in this flat part of the curve right here. We are not in the elbow of the curve, but we're, we're going to get there. So will this get us out of the mess? The mess is when we were up here. Now we're down here with faster cores. They say, yes, we will in the short term. But if the workload spikes or grows, we're going to get right back into it. We'll say, well, well like, what, what kind of workload do we, you know, how bad does the workload have to, to get? Well, it looks like that's probably going to start getting really bad right around 13, 14 user calls per millisecond. And if you've actually you know, plotted your, your like user calls over time and you see the graph, you can say, well, it looks like in about six months, that looks about when we're going to hit about this 13, 14 user calls per millisecond. That means we're going to, our CPUs is going, to, is going to have a negative effect on the performance of our system. And that's how you can actually kind of use this. Okay. All right. So that's, that's one way to do that. Okay. So what we did here, okay. What we did is we reduced the service time by 20%, keeping, keeping um, everything else the same. Well, I should say keeping, what does everything mean? Um, let's see, the queues per server, uh, servers, and the arrival rate the same okay because the, the, we we got to let the utilization float because as we change the you know these parameters it will have it will affect the utilization okay let's do let's do one more of these okay because this is an interesting one here okay if we add 20 percent more cpu cores will that get us out of the mess okay so instead of having faster cores we're going to do the classic, which is better, faster or more cores. Okay, well, let's do this. So instead of faster cores, so it's the same speed, so our service time will be exactly the same. So I'm going to set my case two service time to what it is in case one, but I'm going to reduce, no, I'm going to increase the number of cores, the servers per queue. So instead of 12, I'm going to say, well, it's 12 times 1.2, which is going to increase this by 20%. Now, mathematically, I have 14.4 cores. The cool thing with queuing theory is that it doesn't, you don't have to jump in integer values. So I can actually, I can actually say, hey, let's go with 14.4. Okay. If you don't like that, you say, Craig, we physically can't do that. Um, okay. Well, so, so then what, so what is physically possible? 16? Then, then, then put 16 in here. You know, remember, this is all sorts of what-if scenarios. The more what-ifs you do, the better you will understand kind of the landscape of what's happening. Okay, so let's go with 14.4, where our utilization dropped from 96 to 80%. 80, 80%. The queue length dropped, okay? The queue time dropped, every, everything dropped. So let's see, let's compare the graphs right now. Okay, boom, all right. So the arrival rate is right around this 11 again. So this is where we were. This is where we are. So you know what? This, this solution will also work. Okay. But again, if we have a, a workload increase, eventually we're going to get into the elbow of the curve. So this situation, more cores actually shifted the curve to the right. It kind of went, it went to the right here. Okay. Now, the real question for you, and I'm not going to do this, is which is better? more cores or faster cores kind of my challenge for you is have one of these cases be more cores one of these cases be faster cores and compare them and see which one would you choose which, what do you think what are the factors what's involved in, in choosing one of these others uh, if you email me your response to that i will respond back to you with a little discussion about that okay so in what we do here 
is we increased the number of servers per queue by 20%. Okay, that's what we did. Okay, uh, faster or more? Okay, uh, you, you have to, which is better? I want you to compare those. And the, I'll tell you, the answer is not that simple of just saying faster or more. There's a discussion. There's more to it than that. Okay, all right. So we're, we're coming to the, to the end here. So I just want to make a final note here and then we'll be done here, okay? So the key point, okay, if you plan and forecast your utilizations, like you actually plot the utilization growth over time, queuing theory is really not necessary. I'm serious, okay? What queuing theory is the most useful is that it, it helps you to quantify how risky we are playing this game. So like if you put the numbers in and you say, listen, in six months, we're gonna be here. That is risky. Are we exactly gonna be at the, the forecast of utilization? No, but clearly there's, we've detected some risk. That's what this is really useful for, okay? And, and understanding when somebody says, hey, you know, we got these cores that are 20% faster, it's gonna solve all your problems. You put the math in here and you're thinking, uh, no, we're still in the elbow of the curve. That that's I don't think that's going to solve all of our problems. So you use it for those kind of more conceptual, higher level kind of questions. Okay. Um, okay. But it's even more useful in understanding how changing the parameters, that's like the arrival rate, the serve, all that, how and how that, um, and, and how to change the parameters. Like, well, if I, if I double the workload, which parameter is going to change? The service time, the, the arrival rate, the, Cues per server or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. That's that. Um, if, if you know how to relate the what if questions to the parameters in the spreadsheet, then you really can use this effectively to answer all sorts of what if questions. Okay. All right. So I'll get back to the questions because I want to finish up here and then we'll answer those. Okay. Now, the next webinar, this is just going to be for ORPUB members. Just really, I, I, I actually did this webinar on purpose. Um, really for the uh, to kind of for the members because this is a classic question and, and if you guys watched my videos I, I will say when we do a time-based analysis think AWR report Oracle time-based analysis usually what we focus on is reducing time right we want to reduce time because that improves the user experience but if you've watched me and listened to me closely I would say usually we want to reduce the time but not always. There is an exception to the rule, and I rarely take the time to explain it. I do in, my, in the AWR LVC. That's because it gets us into a whole nother discussion. And that get in this, and in, in, I say, well, why reducing DB time, right? The big piles of time is not always the best objective, okay? If we understand some queuing theory basics, what we talked about that today, it's gonna help us understand why we don't always go for less time, okay? And now we're set up to answer that question. So the, the next webinar, it's gonna be for members. We're gonna talk specifically about this, this situation where we don't always go for minimizing the time. Okay, it's kind of a little different, but you gotta understand this queuing theory stuff before the answer to that makes, makes uh, sense. I mean, really deeply. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna take time to answer the questions, but I've gone a few minutes late here. I, I wanted to stop at the top of the hour. So, um, um, I'm not going to cut off here, but I do want to say, you know, those of you who need to go, thank you for being at the webinar. I hope it was really useful to you. And if you have questions, feel free to email me the questions. Okay, members, it'd be great if you actually slack those on our forum right here, then everybody can actually, you know, see the questions. Oh, yeah, like Bob Honey already, already slacked one. Excellent, Bob Honey. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is officially it. Thank you guys for watching. hope you have a great uh, rest of the week. And all the best in your Oracle performance tuning endeavors. Okay, now, those of you that are like really into this and uh, you want to get some questions, uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and answer those. Okay, yeah, thank you all for being here too. I really appreciate it. We had a huge group today. I guess people do care about queuing theory after all, huh? All right, so question here. Thiago said, more cores would be more viable due to physical limitations. So you could go, yeah, that's one of the things to consider. Yeah, how much space can I fit them in the box? How much does it cost? Do we have budget? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, faster cores would be good because it provides better flexibility 
and keeps the elbow of the curve a little distant. That is definitely, definitely true. Yes, that can be very good. Less cores means less need to handle OS interruption signals. Yes, yeah, that's getting a little deeper, but yeah, I would think so. All right. Uh, oh, Dolly, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, James, well, oh, thank you. I'm glad you, you, you enjoyed it. Ah, it's nice to have people that aren't members. I mean, I love Orpa members, right? You guys put food on my table, you are my number one priority. But it's nice to have a bigger audience do sometimes. Um, but any other, any any specific questions? Oh, I'm going to hit Bob Hani's questions in a second. Um, yeah, um, Elvis said getting the values for the following. Okay, actually, it's really easy. Okay, you can get everything we talked about right from an AWR report. Okay, you can get uh, well the number of servers, the number of queues per server, the number of cores. Don't trust the AWR report on that. You know, you you probably know what the cores are. If not, ask the OS guys. Okay, if you're dealing with AIX, I think you might be on AIX, Elvis, and you have like logical cores and all that. Okay, it's a completely different situation. It's a stinking mess. Yeah, yeah, it's a mess. And the only way this is going to work for you is if the cores, what a core, whatever a core means, is that it's it it sticks. Okay, so you need to know at that point in time. Okay, there are yeah, there's. There's complications on this. However, if you understand how to use the spreadsheets and what the values mean, you can still use the spreadsheet and you can still learn. And you can see, well, okay, if AIX like magically doubles the number of cores, what usually happens though is the, the service time, the time to process the user call is also going to increase. That's what they don't tell you. Okay. But if you actually do the math and you like it, you know, like um, and you and you look at the arrival rate and all this, you know, you will notice, wow, when AIX gives me more cores, logical, right? The service time increases. That's because there's still this like you still have like the same number of cores, perhaps, right? But but virtually they say, well, you have twice as many. Well, you don't get twice the power. Right. There's all there. It doesn't work like that in, in in physical reality. And you will be able to see these numbers reflect that. OK, so, yeah. So you got you can use it in, in some really interesting ways. You will learn a lot about the, the, the logical partitioning, the LPARs. And, and do we really get more power or not? All that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, how did you oh, how did you calculate the arrival rate? OK, excellent question. All right, um, let's look at an AWR report. How about that? That's probably the best way to actually do this. So let me just, uh, let me go back. Let me look at some of my courses here, uh, my AWR course here. And let's just grab AWRs to use. Uh, okay, here's the one, the classic one that I use. Hey, this is not production data, so I'm I'm not worried about doing it. Wait, where is this thing? Here we go. Okay, so okay, we're gonna. So those of you that are watching, uh, we're actually gonna figure out the the uh, you, uh, the uh, we're actually gonna put these numbers. We're gonna grab from the AWR report here. Okay, so we need to know the elapsed time, which is a weird sixteen point seven two. So let's actually put this in. Okay, so what I need to do is um, this is the snapshot interval. Okay, minutes. Okay, I need to know my total workload. All right, so my total workload. Let's just we can use user calls. Uh, by the way, this is per second, right? Uh, this is a this is so small. Per millisecond, this is going to be super tiny. Okay, let's just, we're going to go per second on this stuff. Okay, uh, all right. So let me just look for user calls. I go down to the instance statistic to get the raw values. Okay, and. Uh, user user calls what stu user calls right here so there were 779 of these and that's really small okay user calls 779 user calls okay over um over the snapshot interval okay so so what would my arrival rate be okay and the arrival rate is going to be user calls uh, yeah well, okay, user calls 
per second we're going to do. Okay, so that's going to be your 779 divided uh, 16. 7, 2. Now that's minutes, so I got to convert minutes to seconds. So I'm going to multiply that by 60. Now, when I do this on a piece of paper, I always use the units and I do the cancellation like, like I used to do in remember chemistry class where you converted moles to joules to whatever and you did all the all that. I do that manually, but it's I can't do that, you know, typing like this. But um, I think I multiply it by 60. Okay. And if I do I do the math on that, actually, gosh. I should use SQL plus if I'm a real DBA, but I got something almost as good here. This guy right, ah, right here. Here we go. Here we go. Whoop. That is 0 0.7765, 0 0.7765, okay? 765, and that's going to be user calls. I'll put user calls per second like that, okay? So that's how I would actually get the arrival rate right there. Okay, uh, the utilization, I can get that off the AWR report or I can calculate it myself. The number of cores, um, you can use the AWR report to, to, to give you like an idea, but I'd, I'd always check that though. Okay, always check that. Okay, so the only unknown is gonna be that service time. And you can use the spreadsheet to actually then kind of back in and derive what that service time is gonna be. Right? So I would, you would actually put this number, the 0.7765, you would actually put that uh, right here, 0.7765. That's where you'd actually put that, and this would be user calls per second and all that kind of stuff, okay? So that's how you would do that, okay? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, actually. Um, yeah, it, but you know, you gotta, I'm, I'm glad we have the recording on that so people can see that if they want. Okay, any other questions? I want to respect you guys' times here. All this, um, this um, the recording will be put online, but it's it won't be on until this afternoon. I got other stuff going on right after this, so I won't be able to render the video um, until until uh, you know for a few hours. But I will put the typing log on um, immediately. Okay, I will put that on right away when I'm done here, so you can you know you can look at some of these numbers and use the spreadsheet right away. Okay, all right. Anybody else? Any questions? Oh, Bob Honey, you had a question, didn't you? Um, is it possible to find out practically if one of the processors is queuing? Oh, okay. Like CPU, one of the processes. Oh, one of the actual processes. Um, that would be like an Oracle kind of thing, right? We're talking like, are we waiting like on an IO wait event or are we burning CPU? That kind of, that kind of thing. If, if you used ASH, you would notice that you're burning a lot of C, you know, your CPU samples would be much would be like higher than your your wait time samples okay um uh, i don't know if that answered your question though uh, let's see the possible I'm practically one of the process so you folks on one if you want to look at one of the processes um from an oracle perspective you could use ash to kind of figure that kind of thing out um you could use dbms monitor to it to get down to a particular session to kind of figure this thing out if you're looking at an operating system, I don't know how you do that per process at an OS level. There's probably a way to do it, but that's like an that's ask an operating system guy that question. See what they say. Okay, uh, where do you get the spreadsheet, Mike? You came in late. All right, you go to this incredibly useful website called orapub.com, and you click on tools or excuse me resources. And then go to tools. I should. I'll put the. I'll put the link. Uh, here's the main. The first link. And you scroll down because it's not. You know, it's not the most popular tool. So I keep it down here at the bottom. Here's this queuing theory spreadsheet right here. You click that to, and then you just go through the download process, and you'll you'll get it right there. And this webinar will be the first video right here. I'll have at the bottom when it's done. Okay. So let me put that actually in the typing log where to get the spreadsheet, you go th there, and here's the queuing theory, XLS. Ba basically, um, so how to, say where to get the tool. Okay, you go to orpub.com, tools, and then you actually look for the queuing theory uh, spreadsheet. 
Okay, and then here's the here's some more for you. Okay. All right, got it. There you go. Back. If you're super lazy, here you go, man. <laughs> okay, got it. All right. Anything else? Okay. And we are officially, oh, 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 just in time. Could you briefly discuss about the class on July 31st? Um, all right. That is the, that is the fast path, I believe, right? All right. So the fast path class, yes, right here. Okay, class content right here. Okay, this thing is built really for people that are like brand new Oracle DBAs. And when they really, they come to my website and I specifically did this for new, especially for, um, um, for, for new OrPub members. It was difficult for them to, you know, to to jump right in to looking at all the video learning, and because they're just like, I don't even know, like, really, what's an SGA, or what's a what's an Oracle session? How does it relate to an OS process, and 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 why do I need to learn about top, and and how how, how do what's a client process, what's a server process, all, all just that kind of stuff, you know, what what is the weight interface? How do I use an AWR report at the most basic level? It's those kind of questions, and those are our roadblock a huge roadblock, a massive learning curve for people that are just jump into Oracle. So I created the fast path course and I wanted the cost to be like as low as I could actually get it. This is the standard. This is like the, you know, US price right here. Um, and I only wanted to make it a few sessions, four sessions and to kind of to jumpstart people. Okay. And so this is really what, uh, you know, what it's all about. Okay. And here's kind of the outline um, and all that. Okay, all the details and and all my LVCs I record them. Okay, um, just for you, you know the people that are part of the class and the recordings are kept online for you, like basically you know forever. I, I have no plans of of removing those, so you can always go back and rewatch them. People do that a lot, especially in the AWR and the Ash LVCs. They watch they rewatch them quite a bit. I notice. All right. Um, can I apply all the learning today to Oracle Performance Eng Application Engineered Systems? Um, yeah. No, no. You got to be careful though, right? When we're, you can't just. If you actually want to do a real forecast, there's a lot more to it than this, and that's what I talk about in my performance engineering class, which was basically my my forecasting class that I used to do. Right, um, except I use R instead of Microsoft Excel now when I do the performance engineering class. I use R a lot now, um, but yeah, you can use this. Yeah, Q in theory, you can use it like on anything. You can use it when you go to restaurants, when you're when you're on a road. You know, it's 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 all around us. You, you like you cannot escape Q in theory. You live in a Q in theory world. So what we talked about today, you can actually, I mean, you can apply to to like just all sorts of different stuff that you do. It's crazy, man. Yeah, it's it's scary. Once you start thinking about it, it's like I live in a cubing theory world and I cannot get out of it. It's like a matrix kind of. Thing. All right, anything else? Okay, that's it. We're officially done. I'm gonna shut down and uh, I'll start getting this all this stuff online for you, okay? Um, oh, if you want to do a rack system, um, you can. What you what you probably want to do is do the total number. Assuming your workload is balanced, you take the total number of cores and then reduce it by at least like 15, 20 percent, and that's kind of what you can expect to get out of your rack cluster. That actually works pretty good. So, okay, thanks for joining us, guys. I'm shutting down. <laughs>